Has Colombia's peace process failed the indigenous people it's promised to protect? The Minga Indigena movement converging on Bogota last week to remind the government of its responsibilities in the face of drug dealers, cattle ranchers and dissident rebel groups that four years after a historic UN brokered deal to end civil war still hold sway, it seems, over vast swathes of the country's remote interior and continue to kill and intimidate with impunity. We'll ask about the uh, Conservative government's response, in particular after the killing of a well-known ELN rebel commander over the weekend in the west of the country. What prospects for lasting peace in Colombia? What future for indigenous people throughout South America? They had reason to cheer in Chile Sunday with a constitutional referendum that paves the way for a recognized status for the Mapuche and other long ignored indigenous groups. How far will that recognition take them? As we'll see, it's about much more than just land rights. Today in the France 24 debate, we're asking if we're seeing broken peace, a broken peace process in Colombia. And joining us uh, from the capital, Bogota City Councilor Susana Mohammed of the leftist Patriotic Union Party. Thanks for joining us. Hello, thanks uh, for the invitation. Uh, we are uh, joined from Washington by Cynthia Arnson, director of the Latin America program at the Wilson Center Think Tank. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Uh, we, we hope to be joined soon by Diego Milano, of, uh, director of the Colombian Presidency's administrative department's uh, technical issues on the line. We'll hope to have those fixed soon. The France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24debate. Let's begin with uh, one report. It reportedly happened this past Saturday. News website uh, Columbia reports saying the 34th massacre of indigenous people since the start of the year had happened. Five victims, members of the native Colombian Zenu people and their attorney in the uh, town of San Marcos, that's in northern Sucre province. Last week's uh, convergence of indigenous people on Bogota's Bolivar Square, reminiscent of the mass protests of last year. Now, despite the current COVID spike, demonstrators who drove by the busload to the capital insist it was a necessity to be there. Susanna Mohammed, how bad is it right now for Colombia's indigenous people? It is really bad because actually their land are in a crossroads of uh, drug trafficking and illegal um, economies uh, that are trying to capture the territory that uh, the uh, FARC left as they signed the peace agreement. And the state has not actually come to cope those territories uh, with social programs, with justice and with governance, uh, leaving these people, uh, peasants, indigenous people, uh, alone in the territory. And what we are seeing is mass massacres happening in Colombia, almost 42 these years. Almost uh, 20,000 people have been displaced forcefully, and we don't see any strong reaction from the government, but more coming to an authoritarian response, which will not help to solve these issues. And as social leaders, indigenous people and peasants are killed, uh, the government basically uh, has a policy to uh, go against uh, mass mobilization when people try to dialogue with uh, the government to find a solution. Uh, this is also causing a lot of social tension and is not allowing um, to get a, a, a resolve for the issue. And most worrying, uh, these territories are now uh, starting to be coped by uh, organized crime, uh, foreign organized crime from Mexican drug cartels and also uh, from other type of uh, organizations. Uh, the government, which uh, warned against demonstrating, it said, for sanitary reasons, because of COVID. 
Yes, but actually uh, people are more exposed to be killed in these areas by violence than by COVID. And then the government expects people to stay waiting for these uh, drug cartels to come and kill them. And uh, the worst thing is, is not e uh, e even the capacity of the government to dialogue to find a solution. Uh, the indigenous people have to come all the way to Bogotá, a thousand of them, to be able to get an appointment with the government, with the president, and the president denied dialogue. So basically now the social movement uh, is going uh, to come to judicial um, actions because there is no response, not even the capacity to enter a dialogue to see how we solve these issues and the inaction of the government. At the same time, what we see is an authoritarian response, like the 10 people, the 10 young people that were killed in Bogota one month ago by the abuse of police and the lack of compliance of the Minister of Defense uh, from the Constitutional Court that order the government to be able uh, to guarantee uh, mass protest and social protest, which is actually one of the fundamental rights of people. Even if we are in, uh, in COVID-19, uh, we young people in some of the um, neighborhoods in Bogota, popular sectors, and also in, in these faraway lands are more um, susceptible to be killed uh, by violence than by COVID. Cynthia Aronson, uh, four years ago, when we had that historic breakthrough that ended uh, uh, Latin America's longest uh, guerrilla war uh, between the government and uh, the leftist FARC rebellion. We were all wondering at the time, we're talking about remote areas of the country, what would happen when, when there'd be a quote unquote power vacuum? Um, what has happened in those areas in the last uh, four years? What was anticipated? Well, I think there was certainly the, the hope that as the um, the FARC guerrillas were demobilizing, that the that state authorities would move in, not not just in a police or a military sense, but with a full complement of of services, of health, of education, um, and and that kind of thing. And one of the sort of enduring mysteries to me, um, going back to the Santos administration, not just under the the uh, Duque administration, is why. Um, that kind of occupation of territory um, didn't take place almost immediately because the the power vacuum um, could have been and should have been and probably was anticipated. And yet, for a variety of reasons, um, the government did not move to fill those spaces. And I think that that accounts for the levels of violence um, certainly against indigenous peoples, um, but also against the whole sort of panoply of, of social leaders and, and human rights activists and land rights activists who have been murdered. Um, and and then, when, I'm sorry to interrupt. When the government when the government didn't deploy, it, it, why is it is it because they didn't have the means to do it? So what what's the reason? Well. That's a good question to ask the government. Um, they were talking about uh, means, numbers, um, the ruggedness of the terrain, the difficulty of the terrain, um, all of which, you know, are true. But I think it it could have been anticipated that there was going to be um, uh, a much greater need for for state presence. And the absence of, of state presence, the absence of the of the you know demobilized guerrillas, has created uh, this vacuum that other actors are quite easily and with impunity um, filling. Uh, criminal actors of all stripes, rearmed FARC drug traffickers, uh, the ELN guerrillas. You mentioned that at the at the beginning of uh, of the broadcast. Um, and the security situation in, in, you know, in many, many parts of, of uh, Colombia outside of urban areas um, is, is, um, is extremely worrisome. All right, we are pleased now to join to welcome from Bogota, uh, Diego Milano, director of the Colombian presidency's uh, uh, um, administrative department. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate. Oh, thanks a lot for the invitation to all the team of France 24 debate. Um, you, we just heard Cynthia Arnson say that uh, uh, under President Duque, but also under his predecessor, President Santos, there wasn't a deployment to these areas uh, where the FARC rebellion was decommissioned. And thus, um, you have this uh, 
spike in killings and intimidation and the targeting of indigenous peoples today. What's your response? Tego Milano, can you hear us? Heavy security to those areas that have been. Yes, I I can hear you perfectly. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, can you hear to me? Loud and clear. Okay, President Duque, President Duque during his administration has been uh, acting basically with a security strategy, deploying forces in those areas where uh, for FARC. Are the demobilized groups? Uh... Right, we seem to have trouble with the connection. Unfortunately, we're going to try to uh, we're going to try to uh, to reconnect uh, uh, as soon as we can uh, with Diego Milano. Apologies for for that. Um, Susanna Mohammed, uh, the 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 uh, uh, that incident that I mentioned at the outset uh, sparked. Um, uh, or the, the lead up to uh, the killing that I mentioned over the weekend. Um, according to the uh, Colombian press, a uh, land rights activist, a 70, 72-year-old Hernando Benitez Leon, uh, was murdered in the run-up uh, to that killing. What, what's been the pattern, if you will, in these remote rural areas? Yes, I think there are three main reasons why, uh, or the, the type of victims that we're seeing. One of the key ones are land uh, rights uh, claim, people that are claiming uh, uh, land rights. And, and this is because, basically, this is one of the core struggles in Colombia. I think this government that we have now in power has not the political will to enforce um, uh, the rural um, uh, modifications, the rural uh, process that we needed to do uh, to actually be able to have more justice in land access. And uh, uh, land is a, a critical uh, factor of dispute with these uh, other illegal armed, armed groups. So there's people that are uh, close to this uh, political party that is now in power that have been also be uh, got benefits from the war in terms of land rights. And, and this is one of the key disputes that we have. It's a political dispute. That's why uh, land, uh, people are reclaiming land are one of the main victims. A second set of victims are those that are opposing uh, projects uh, for uh, oil, uh, energy, uh, mining from legal and illegal sources are also victims, like um, uh, environmental uh, uh, human rights defenders are the other pattern uh, on victims. And another one, which is very critical, is uh, peasants that um, agreed, based on the peace process, to replace their illegal coca crops with um, legal crops, and that were part of a benefit from the government. Uh, and this program uh, has not have come complete implementation, but the people that are leading this, uh, the peasants, are being killed also, uh, because they are opposing, uh, of course, the interests of the drug dealers that want to impose um, the illegal economy of drugs in the, in the rural areas of Colombia. So I think those three are one of the key. And, and worryingly, I have to say, now we are seeing killings of political opposition. So from my political party, we had three killings in the last two weeks. We have threats in in whole departments against our militants, even in Bogota. So also we are seeing now something that is very worrying in Colombian history, which is political violence. And we don't see any reaction uh, from the government. Uh, we had also, like this week, uh, we wanted to talk to the interior minister uh, as a political party with our leader, Gustavo Petro. And, and they didn't even uh, organize the meeting, and, and uh, they are killing the political opposition. So this is not very good towards 22 mm. election uh, process. Uh, and we feel this lack of governance in the country, which is actually uh, going deeper into what you were mentioning, this vacuum of power in, in, in many regions of the country. We also feel like a la lack of governance in general. When we come back, we're going to take a look at uh, the government's uh, response when it comes to that other rebellion, the ELN, uh, which uh, is still active. Uh, when we come back, you're watching the France 24 debate.
Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. Four years on, we're asking if it's a broken peace process in Colombia, what with indigenous people, uh, more and more uh, the target of killings and intimidation. We're with Bogota City Councilor Susana Mohammed of the uh, leftist uh, patriotic Union Party was telling us just before the break how some members of her party have also been targeted. Diego Milano, director of the Colombian presidency's administrative department, uh, joins us. And from Washington, Cynthia Arnson, director of the Latin America program uh, at the Wilson Center uh, think tank. Uh, Cynthia, the, uh, the protest movement is called Minga Indigena. How do you translate that? Well, indigena means indigenous, and minga is an indigenous word that really means sort of a collective um, gathering around a common purpose, but it's come to uh, mean in the Colombian context and, and in other countries, particularly in the Andean region where there are large indigenous populations, to mean, you know, um, a march or uh, a, a, of a sort of protest movement um, nature. Um, and, you know, clearly people are feeling a lot of pressure, do not feel that the that they're getting the attention that they need from um, from the senior uh, authorities of, of the government. But there's also been, I mean, I think a longstanding um, concern about various social movements being um, penetrated by or manipulated by um, insurgent movements. Um, this was certainly true during the time um, of the FARC insurgency prior to the peace process when there would be, for example, protests by um, growers of coca, for example, the raw material for cocaine. Um, and I would not be surprised if some of that um, attitude remained that these are, um, you know, sort of not um, authentic um, non-governmental organizations, but have some kind of pol opposition political force behind them. I'm not in a position to comment on that. And I think that the demands themselves on the surface in terms of um, violence, in terms of land rights, um, are, are legitimate and have not been given sufficient attention. Yeah, that, that was one of the uh, uh, reports that was floated when it came to uh, a high-profile rebel, not with the FARC, but with the ELN movement, which is still active, a senior commander uh, who uh, 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 the, uh, the accusation level by government sources was that he had penetrated those uh, uh, demonstrations. He was killed uh, over the weekend. Uriel uh, was his, uh, his, uh, his nickname, um, um, a figurehead of the ELN, what with his many social media appearances. Karis Garland has more on that. Known for his online videos and social media presence, one of the main leaders of Colombia's National Liberation Army, Andres Venegas Londoño, was killed during a military operation. President Ivan Duque said the rebel commander, better known by his nom de guerre Uriel, died in the coastal Pacific province of Choco. In this military operation, a dangerous criminal responsible for crimes such as kidnapping, the murder of social leaders, the harassment of populations, the murder of soldiers and police officers fell. Uriel is accused of being behind a 2019 car bomb attack on a police academy in Bogota, which left 21 recruits dead. The National Liberation Army, or ELN, had been in peace talks with the government, but Duque put an end to them following the attack. The left-wing rebel group was founded in 1964. These days, they're said to operate in about 10% of the country with some 2,300 fighters. It's the last formal guerrilla group left in Colombia after the government reached a peace agreement with the larger Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, or FARC, in 2016. Diego Milano, in the past 24 hours, we've seen statements from the government uh, talking about more consultations with uh, the former FARC rebellion uh, about uh, the security situation and uh, how together to be have a more inclusive way uh, of dealing with it. But how? what's the government's strategy going forward now when it comes to the ELN? President Duque has stated clearly that the only way to go ahead with any kind of negotiation with the ELN 
uh, depends upon four Brexit. The first one is ELN must stop of uh, terrorist attack. Second, they have to liberate any kind of kidnapped people which uh, they have at this moment. Third, they have to stop to recruit children and young people in the rural areas of Colombia. And fourth, of course, they have to uh, uh, stop the, the narco-traffic activities which they are now using as excuse in different regions of Colombia in order to continue with this illegal business. And, and what's your response when you, when Susanna Mohammed says that uh, not enough's uh, being done to stamp out impunity uh, with a, more and more extrajudicial killings, including members of her own party? First of all, the enemy of the indigenous communities and social leaders all around the country are the narco -traffic. The former insurgent movement of FARC, which he, they didn't demobilize, the, the ELN itself, and also some other narco traffic groups, such as Clan del Golfo in Colombia, are the responsible for the killing of the social leaders. They still have some corridors they want to protect in order to pursue with the illegal business of narco traffic. And in order to have the control of these territories, they are killing people. Um, what has been happening in the last year is that the government has promoted the presence of uh, the military forces and the police in those areas most affected by narco-traffic um, in order to pursue three objectives. The first one is to eradicate the coca uh, in those areas. In the second one, to have the presence of the state and the armed forces in order to protect the civilians in those areas. And third, to promote and to enhance a program in order to protect social leaders. More than 3,500 social leaders have been protected by any particular programs developed and implemented by the government of Colombia. 884 of those indigenous, uh, are, those are indigenous uh, leaders. Of course, we are really are sorry about what happened with some of these uh, social leaders and the, the whole force of the state. Uh, is you know, now working in order to provide security to those leaders and, of course, uh, ensuring that the justice acts and um, the adequate uh, results in those investigations are presented as soon as possible. Susanna Mohammed. Yes, I don't. I mean, I understand uh, what uh, Diego is saying regarding the action of the government, but politically, the government is not with the people that are having the suffering. These killings in my political party are not uh, because of any reason; are because of political reasons. In the threats we are receiving. The people that are threatening and killing militants from Colombia Humana are said because we are from the left. And we are covered by an opposition um, law that the government has the obligation to protect the opposition. But in contrast, what we are seeing is that we are being targeted to be killed, and there is not even a reaction, a political reaction from the government. And also what um, the person that is in, in the U.S. was saying regarding the mass protest and mass protest movements, social protests being infiltrated by insurgent groups is one of the main accusations from the government to actually use force against the mass protests and take out legitimacy of uh, the, the, the actually very just uh, demands that they are putting on the government. The government is not responding uh, with uh, uh, strength to the demands from the people. What they are doing is using repression, abuse, uh, uh, police abuse, uh, and actually uh, what happened in Bogota is terrifying. I was in the massive protest in the street, and I saw myself, the police, uh, abusing the, the people. And we have a minister of defense uh, that has to abide uh, a, a constitutional court order to actually um, take measures to guarantee social protest as a fundamental right. And what he does is, is trying to avoid political control in Congress. What he does is actually the, the president, and the next day, 10 p young people were killed in Bogota, goes to congratulate the police, 10 people that uh, supposedly were killed by the police themselves. So we don't see really a care 
from this government on what's happening to social leaders and what they are is in a political struggle. Uh, they are close to dialogue. They don't even uh, the president doesn't have the, the, the capacity to sit, to talk to the indigenous people that are being killed, uh, and, and they can tell us a lot of, about their programs and what they're doing, but they don't have a democratic and political response. Their response is, is going to authoritarianism, and we are very afraid of that, because that attitude of the government is giving legitimacy to those that think they have the right to threat and kill people that are defending their rights all across the country. Yeah, Diego Milano, that's the charge that's been leveled, that uh, the government does not engage in dialogue enough. Your response? First of all, what just Susana mentioned, and let me address uh, some of the concerns that, that Susana expressed. First of all, we are in a democratic state, and of course, the government, uh, President Duque, the military and the police forces respect democracy and respect the social protests, just only to mention a number. In the last eight months, more than 325 protests, social protests, pacific protests happened in Colombia, and they developed based pacifically, and the security for those protesters has been provided by the military forces and the police, and these protests have been against the government, some of them. Some of the protests have been developed by different social groups. It means that here is a democratic state which the government respects the protests. The second issue that she raised is related to what happened in the last September 9th, in that night after the killing, unfortunately, or a civilian, uh, based on some abuse of police. What happened this night is that because different manifestation of some of civilians, some groups infiltrated, attacked some of the police centers in the neighborhood of Bogota City. More than 63 of these police centers and community centers for the police in those neighborhoods were destroyed, where they fired, and the police were, were under attack. More than 300 police were attacked this night, and of course, this night, the order has to be reestablished by the police and the military forces based on those attacks to the authority and to the police. Of course, recently, there has been a discussion with the Constitutional Court and with the judicial system in order to get a system and a, a, well, say, I will say a protocol in order to how to ensure that the protest uh, is keep uh, developed peacefully. All right, so yeah, we, we, can, like we, we can um, we so can we can talk we can talk about further about what happened there back in September, uh, but time is running short, and I want to get to a few other points that that were mentioned earlier in the discussion. Susanna Mohammed mentioning. Uh, the drug cartels. Uh, that drug trade does continue. A senior advisor to President Duque saying uh, that uh, Colombia, well, is a cog in the wheel, you might say, for Mexican drug cartels who take charge of the buying, trafficking, and sale in the United States. El papel que ellos cumplen básicamente aquí es el de envío de emisarios y de negociadores eh, y también de individuos que verifican la calidad de los estupefacientes que salen por Venezuela o que salen desde el Pacífico Nariñense o el norte de Ecuador hacia Centroamérica y el mercado de los Estados Unidos. Cynthia Artson, uh, as you know, there's an election coming up where you are in Washington. Uh, whether or not, uh, it, whether it's Donald Trump or Joe Biden, what's the policy going to be uh, when it comes to these Mexican drug cartels? And we've reportedly heard people with Mexican accents uh, involved in some of the killings in Colombia? Well, you know, I think that if it, a lot of uh, the approach that the United States will take will be consistent and remain the same, some of it would change under a Biden administration. Um, the Trump administration has, uh, has prioritized um, the law enforcement aspects of fighting, you know, the, the drug trade. Um, and has worked very closely with the Colombian government to uh, support the eradication of coca and to interdict um, drugs, you know, coming from from Colombia. Not all of it from Venezuela. Some of it is. I mean, I think Colombia is still 
the largest source of, of cocaine in the world, not just for the United States, but, but globally. Um, and uh, there are other international criminal organizations that are involved in that. Um, whether there would be a change of approach is hard to predict. Um, there is a congressionally mandated um, commission um, on international narcotics looking into uh, over, you know, just sort of reviewing um, the past number of decades since the 1970s of the U.S. drug wars and trying to find if there is an alternative that might be both politically viable and potentially, um, you know, more effective um, because the the killing goes on and the criminality goes on and the consumption goes on. And so I think there's an incentive to look and see whether there are ways to do things differently. Um, and I'm not sure that there will be a different approach under um, either U.S. administration um, and the, you know, the heavy focus on interdiction will continue and suppression will continue under um, um, under a second Trump administration with an emphasis as well on, on crop substitution. Um, and there may be a greater openness um, within the Biden administration to looking to see what this congressional commission comes up with and seriously explore um, alternatives. Uh, this c crop substitution, Susanna Mohammed. Uh this was the question we were asking already four years ago when the, the peace process with the FARC was uh, coming to uh, the conclusion with the signing of that treaty there. Uh, what, what alternative for their livelihood can we offer uh, citizens who live in these remote parts of Colombia? Right. Actually, the peace agreement itself uh, had the answer about first the social uh, state to come uh, to these regions. Uh, there, there's a, a huge um, isolation of these regions from the key markets in the cities. So how the government can help to facilitate uh, the trade of what uh, the peasants and the indigenous peoples can produce? And how do we create a strong internal uh, market and help in the productive process? Uh, and that's the key for substituting the illegal crops with legal crops. But if you want to substitute illegal crops with legal crops, and then people don't have how to take that to the markets, and they are in very far away regions, and they and right now the, the pace of implementation of the rural reform and the pace of implementation of this productive process is very slow. And the government itself is applying a policy that is against to this, for example, uh, uh, forcing eradication, uh, which creates lack of uh, trust with these families that actually help to sign this peace agreement and also abandon the peasants uh, in these faraway regions, then it's going to be very difficult. And they want to impose, again, the use of glyphosate or of uh, this um, chemical uh, way of uh, dealing with the crops, which uh, in Europe, for example, you can't use this anymore because it's poisonous. And, and uh, the government wants to impose with uh, Mr. Trump this method for crop reduction of, of cocaine, of, co of coca leaf. Uh, against the will of environmentalists, against the will of the peasants, and not supporting enough uh, this. So we, if we get, again, in the mentality of the war against drugs, which has been the mentality of the last 40 years, we're going to see the same results we have seen in the last 30 years, which is that uh, we give more power, basically, to the drug trade. And more power to the drug trade means more violence in the rural areas of Colombia and less capacity for the government to control this. But now we don't have a part of state regulating this, which was the role of FARC. We actually have anarchy of organized crime. And it's very dangerous for the future of Colombia. Uh, seeing what's happening in Mexico, we don't want to come back to the 90s. But I am afraid that that's what we're doing with the policy. Diego Milano, uh, Colombia in the 90s was ahead of the curve, you might say, in the sense that its constitution uh, enacted the fact that uh, in, recognized the rights of indigenous people. Uh, a lot of that is also, uh, again, about land rights. And a lot of the disputes we're seeing today is indigenous people who want the right to be able to work the land that's been stolen from them. Is any progress being made? Well, 
definitely. And um, basically, in order first to answer to to some of the the um, concerns that just uh, Susana mentioned. First of all, what happened, unfortunately, after the peace agreement is that the, the hectares of coca raised to the historical numbers. Basically, after in the year 2010, in Colombia, reduced the hectares of coca to more or less 15,000. After the peace agreement with uh, FARC, the number of coca rose to around 116,000 hectares, which is a disaster because this number of hectares of coca basically increased violence and increased the ability of some of the these terrorist groups like the former FARC um, and those who didn't sign the agreement or ELNL, uh, ELN in order to have control of those areas. The government has committed to decrease those areas because it's the only way to reduce violence. Which happens in the indigenous communities is that those groups, such as the FARC, such as ELN, are going to those indigenous communities and reserves in order to promote the cultivation of coca. And of course, it creates violence and it develops like kind of assassinations and killings and mass killings of indigenous social leaders. Then that's why the first priority of the government is to reduce the hectares of coca first. The second, the after the, the peace agreement, a program was created, or today more than 100,000 or peasants or cultivators of coca are in a program in order to develop a program for substitution, alternative development. Those peasants are working with the government in the cultivation of cacao, in the cultivation of, co of coffee, in the cultivation of products such as uh, forestry in those areas. It means that the government has kept the promise and have working with them in order that they move to the illegal com uh, illegal economy to the legal economy. But of course, the problem is and the, that this is the priority of President Duque to control the narco traffic. Unfortunately, after the peace agreement, uh, the narco traffic continues in Colombia, and that's why the first priority is to eradicate, and that's why we have to do it because this is a priority. It's the coca is the fuel for, for violence in Colombia. The All right, coca, so the, the, fuel, the fuel for violence in Colombia, Colombia. Just, just very briefly, because we're, we're, we're out of time, I just want to mention Sunday, Chile overwhelmingly approving the drawing up of an entirely new constitution. Expectations high there. Among issues likely to be at the fore are recognition of Chile's Mapuche indigenous population, the Mapuche who for a year now have been at the fore of protests against inequality there. Uh, like you can see these images from Santiago. This was back on uh, Columbus Day uh, or earlier this month. Susana Mohammed, uh, indigenous rights on South America more broadly. Are you optimistic? I, I think it's a huge step, and I think there's a, a, a political coalition that is happening uh, right now between the indigenous people and the young people in the cities. And that's very interesting because it creates a new political subject, one that uh, starts the, the urban uh, population, especially the young people, start recognizing the importance of this diversity, cultural diversity that we have in our countries. because. Young people are very aligned and understood, understands clearly the climate crisis we are in, and they understand that the knowledge of these indigenous people, that their territories, which are at least in Colombia, the source of water for everybody, need to be um, conserved. And we need to gain governance of those indigenous peoples over those territories if we want to have any success to adapt uh, to the threat of the climate crisis. So this uh, coalition of the urban sectors with the indigenous people, I think, is creating a very interesting uh, subject in, in, in the South America, political subject, uh, which we already seen, for example, in Bolivia, that we already have seen in Ecuador, and that is starting to happen in countries like Colombia and also like Chile, which I think like gives Chile, me a lot of saying. hope that uh, the roots of this continent are going to move uh, to be able to uh, face 
the threat of authoritarianism and the threat uh, of the climate crisis. All right. Well, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. Susanna Mohammed, I want to thank you. I want to thank as well Diego Milana and Cynthia Arnson for joining us. The apologies, the Skype gods were not with us for this edition. We want to thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.